Welcome to our Discoveries Off event. I'm Lisa, I'm the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries, and I am beyond thrilled that the amazingly talented and totally fabulous Neil Gaiman agreed to pre-record an interview for us to coincide with our special promotion of his book, The Graveyard Book. Hello, Neil. Hello, Lisa. It's really good to meet you virtually and obviously to virtually meet the entirety of Suffolk. Hello, Suffolk. And hello from Suffolk, Neil. Thank you so much. As I mentioned, we do have this promotion here of your brilliant book, Neil, The Graveyard Book. Yet your passion and desire to write did start at such a young age, thanks to C.S. Lewis and other great authors. How have their works influenced you as an author? I think C.S. Lewis probably influenced me mo most by showing me that there was an author. Um, I'd read authors up to that point who were fairly invisible. They, they were transparent authors. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote as if he was a real person writing for a friend and telling that friend this fabulous story and as if it was all real and there was something in the tone of voice that drew you in and that made you feel there was a real person going on there and I loved that. I, I, I think that was huge. That definitely made me go, oh, I want to be able to do this thing. Um, I could probably point to other authors that I met when I was very young and point to the things they did and say, well, I, I loved this about them. I loved the way that P.L. Travers, who wrote the Mary Poppins stories, imbued the world with an unpredictable magic and made you feel like you weren't necessarily in a fair universe, but you were definitely in an interesting one. Um, as a kid, I loved, well, fairy tales. Um, I would read anything that had witches or magic in it and I remember falling in love with lots of books that are pretty much out of print right now um, by authors who are almost forgotten. Authors like Margaret Story, authors like the astonishing Nicholas Stewart Grey, a Scottish author who, who wrote fairy tale retellings. Um, and, but the thing is, I think you take something from everybody you encounter when you're a kid. You just, you're like somebody walking through the woods, finding all of these fabulous little treasures that other people have dropped before you and picking them up and putting them in your basket. I love that, Neil. That's such a wonderful description of what it's like as a child to find, as you say, fabulous treasures. And I felt very much the same reading C.S. Lewis as well. I loved his books and feel that you've very much captured the writing as if a friend you've described in your own books. Yet before becoming an author yourself, you asked R.A. Lafferty, who was a favourite science fiction author of yours, for advice on becoming an author. Did you ever imagine then that your own books would end up becoming so very popular? No. Um, I mean, R.A. Lafferty, when I wrote to him, was almost unknown. I just happened to love him and love his work and wrote to him thinking maybe he'd write back, and he did. But I never ever expected to be, I, actually, I, I suppose I, if I ever expected to be anything, it probably would have been about as popular as R.A. Lafferty, which is to say, more or less unknown, but a few people would love what that person did. Um, the, 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 the big thing for me was never the idea of becoming a big fancy best-selling author because what I wanted to do 
was write comics and write science fiction and write fantasy and and write for kids. And none of those were professions in which you became a big fancy best-selling author. Those were all professions in which you wrote things that, if you were lucky, a few people fell in love with. And that was really all I cared about. I think, Neil, what you just said is the best possible motivation for writing books and becoming an author. It's for the love of it. And I'm also a huge fan of your book, Good Omens, which, of course, you wrote with the extraordinary Terry Pratchett. What was it like working with him? What was it like working with Terry Pratchett? It was wonderful. Um, Terry was a delight. We would talk every day. In a weird way, the talking every day was more fun than the writing the book, or at least the writing the book was the thing we had to do in order to justify the talking every day, because we would go off on these mad wild tangents. Um, we would invent, we would embroider, we would play with things, and then it was just a mad rush to get to the next really good bit before the other one could. I thought the petition about the Good Omen series would have amused him as obviously as you know Neil it was directed at Netflix when the amazing series is actually on Amazon and for those watching who haven't checked it out it is really superb do give it a watch. I'd love to ask you Neil about the Graveyard book which I've already mentioned is part of a special promotion here in Suffolk. Neil, what was the first scene that came to you when you first started thinking about writing the book? Writing the Graveyard book, the first thing that I ever thought was just the idea. I was watching my son, Mike, who was probably somewhere between 18 months and two years at that point, just riding his little tricycle around the tiny graveyard over the road from our house because we didn't have any kind of garden. So he wanted to ride his tricycle, he was riding it around in the graveyard, and I thought he looks so at home here. And I thought I could write a book about a little kid in a graveyard being brought up by dead people. And then I thought, well, it will be a lot like The Jungle Book, which is a book about a child being brought up in a jungle. And I thought, well, then I'd have to call it The Graveyard Book and actually lean into the jungle bookness of it all. And so I had a fairly clear idea that it would have to begin with the scene in the Jungle Book, where all of the animals are gathered around, all of the wolves are gathered around, arguing about whether or not they will raise this human child. Um, and that's not the very first scene, but that's the first big important scene. I thought well, I had to do one of those. And I tried writing one, and it, mostly when I finished writing my version of chapter one, um, I realized that I just was not ready to write this book. It was a better book than I was a writer and that I would have to put it off and learn, learn my craft. And then when I was ready, come back to it. It's wonderful, Neil, to hear how it all began. And like I'm sure many others, I'm so happy that you did finish the book and the end, because the end result is a totally engrossing read for your fans. But the graveyard book, like Coraline and the Ocean at the End of the Lane, often gets categorised as for young adults. Do you decide to write for a specific audience at the outset? Or do you just follow your passion, write the story, and let your publishers make those decisions? Um, it's a bit of both, really. Sometimes you're writing a book and you go, I am writing a book for children, I'm writing a book for young adults, I'm writing a book for adults. And then sometimes you're just writing a book. Uh, the Ocean at the End of the Lane. I had no idea who that one was for while I was writing it. All I knew that was that I was writing a book. And I think at the end of it, by the time I finished it, I decided it was probably for adults. 
and it was probably for adults because it didn't offer hope and resolution in the way that I would like a children's book to offer hope and resolution. The, the hope was much more low key, the resolution was much more low key, and I thought this will probably be more of a satisfying read for adults than for kids. Thank you, Neil. It's, it's really interesting to hear how you see your work and why you think it suits a certain audience. In the Graveyard book, what about Bod? Will we ever find out what happens for him next? Will we ever find out what happens next to Bod? I don't know. Um, there are more graveyard book books I want to write, but they're more a sort of a Lord of the Rings to the graveyard books Hobbit, a big story about the people and the things and what happened next. And I'm not really sure whether or not we pick up Bod's story in that, or whether we just pick up everybody else's story like Silas's. I would probably have to f actually have to write it in order to find out. Well, Neil, that's great to hear that there are more graveyard books you want to write. Our stock librarian at Suffolk Library, Sophie, would really love to know, have you ever thought up a story that frightened yourself? Have I ever thought up a story that frightened myself? Yes, I have. Um, but also, once you start writing, it's like you step into a different place. Um, so you stop being as frightened when you're enjoying creating frightening things. Um, I mean, I've, I've, the most frightened I think I've ever been by something I did was when I walked in uh, to a room and my daughter had the CD player on and was listening and she was listening to a story that I'd written called Baby Cakes and for a moment I didn't recognize the voice and I was just listening to this story as a story without realizing it was me telling it. And I found you know, myself absolutely shivering at the ideas in the story. But if you're writing, you're doing it all from a different kind of place. You are the one behind the mask waiting to shout out and jump, uh, to jump out and shout boo. And you don't sit there being quite as scared of somebody else in a mask, jumping out and shouting boo at you um, when you're the one that knows that the boo is coming. That must have been so much fun, Neil, as an author to catch your readers unaware. And I love the story about your daughter listening to one of your books. It does make sense that it's only when you have a moment not realising it's actually your book that you get to have the experience that we, as your readers, have. Well, Neil, your amazing book, Norse Mythology, was published several years ago. What was it that attracted you to write about Norse myths? I think I loved Norse myths since I was, what, six? I would have been about six years old. And there were a bunch of comics at that time. One called Fantastic, one called Terrific, and those two... Uh, reprinted Marvel comics and there were adventures of the mighty Thor in there and I just remember going he is so cool he has his hammer he's Norse mythology and picking up a book uh, by Roger Lancelin Grimm called I think Tales of the Norsemen or Myths of the Norsemen and uh, and loving it and um, Realising this wasn't quite what I'd read in the comics, but there was something really interesting happening here. And I couldn't have been older than seven when I read that. Um, and so I loved that just as I loved the ancient Egyptian myths. And um, as I 
you know, as time went on, I would keep going back to the Norse myths. I'd keep using them in different ways and stories in Sandman and then in American Gods. And uh, then I was asked if I would write my own retelling of the Norse myths. And initially I found myself put off because there are some fabulous ones. And then I thought, you know, there aren't any that are quite mine. I think I will, I will go and do mine. I completely agree with you, Neil. North myths are so rich and fabulous, and I can totally understand the attraction. And again, something that influenced you at such an early age. Is there any other myths, folklore, that you're interested in and would love to write about in the future? There are so many. Um, I'd love to do British and Celtic myth. I'd love to do more of the myths of the Fertile Crescent. Um, I, you know, really I love myths. Myths are magical, myths are glorious. Um, some of it just depends on the next time I feel like doing a myth book, what there isn't, and uh, that actually may drive me. I probably would have done Greek myths next, but I love what Stephen Fry did and I love what Natalie Haynes did. And so don't feel like there's particularly room for me to come in and go, aha, because there's fabulous stuff already existing. Whereas I'd be much more interested in perhaps going and looking at some of the ancient British myths. I love uh, Stephen Fry's books and Greek myths as well. They are really excellent. And it's great to know, Neil, that you have an interest in exploring ancient British myths in the future. I think that would be utterly fantastic. How did your storytelling masterclass come about? Uh, the storytelling masterclass came about because masterclass approached my agent and said, would I do a storytelling class? And I'd been, teaching at Bard for the previous five years and actually felt like there were things I wanted to say. I think if they'd approached me five years earlier, I probably would have gone, you know, I, I don't know how to teach this stuff. I don't know what I have to say. But what was nice about the previous five years was that twice a year, I'd wound up saying a lot of the same things over and over, um, which meant that it was relatively easy for me to actually go, well, this is what I have to say. And, you know, talk for eight, 10, 12 hours. And then the masterclass people edited it down to about six very succinct hours and put it out into the world. And I've been hugely relieved that people have enjoyed it and found it very, very useful. Well, I'm really so glad, Neil, that you did agree to do it because my husband and I signed up to Masterclass several years ago and it's a great platform and your storytelling Masterclass is so interesting and helpful. Everyone here, do check that out. Many of your works, Neil, have been transferred onto screen. What's that experience like for you? And are you excited to see the Sandman adaptation when it's finally launched on Netflix? It can be any one of a number of things when you see your work on a screen. It can be an absolute delight. It can be an absolute misery. Um, you can sit there basking in it, going, this is, this is so cool, this is wonderful, this is my ideas, and it come to life. And you can sit there just going, what were they thinking of? Why did they do this? It wasn't this. They've taken my thing that worked and they've made it into something that didn't work. Both of those are, are absolutely valid. Mostly you're somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm incredibly lucky. I've had things like Coraline made, which I just love. I think they're just beautiful. Um, Sandman, we're in the process of making it right now. And every now and again, I just look at the screen in wonder, thinking this was, this was something in my head. And look, it's people and they're moving around. It's amazing. And it really is. Well, I am personally so looking forward to Sam Manil and the images of the set and the props from the series that I've seen look fantastic. 
Yeah, I imagine as well as amazing, it's probably somewhat surreal experience seeing something made into the flesh that just started off as an idea in your mind. It's, it's fantastic. And finally, Neil, my last question is, what's for you the best thing about being an author? The best thing about being an author is that when all else fails, you can head off into the pages of your book and you can become God. And all of the people do more or less what you tell them to. And what happens is more or less what you were hoping would happen. Um, and that's the best thing. A little control which we normally lack out there in the real world. What an awesome answer, Neil. Who doesn't want to be a god? I also love the more or less what you tell them to do. So many authors have told me about how their characters sometimes have a habit of taking them on an unexpected journey. As I've already talked about, the Graveyard book, one of the many outstanding books by Neil, is part of a special promotion here in Suffolk, UK. The book was chosen by our book groups across Suffolk as a must read and it's a brilliant and engrossing book. If you haven't already, do check it out. And I'd just like to finish by thanking you all for joining us for this very special pre-recorded interview with Neil Gaiman. We do have many more upcoming author events, including live events with Mark Billingham and Louise Candish. To be the first to know about our upcoming author events, do join our Facebook group, Discover Reads. The link will be below this video and details of our upcoming events you can also find on our website and Eventbrite. All our events are completely free and open to everyone. But as a charity, if you're able to make a donation, that would be amazing. Thank you, everyone.